Hello, welcome, and this is the latest episode of The Coach's Dugout, the podcast for coaches by coaches. Now, I'm Shasi, and I'm flying solo today because uh, my partners in crime are taking a break for the day. And this podcast is all about football coaching content, creating a healthy coaching circle, and every episode will feature a guest who will talk to us on the theme of the day. Now, today's theme is all about football academies, and we are glad to have a technical director of a football academy here in Singapore, the Lion City Sailors Football Academy. Mr. Luca Lalic. Hi, man. Nice to see you. It's very nice to see you, Luca. And um, you look so serious, just like a TD would be and look like in an in, in, uh, academy. But uh, just before we start, right, Luca, we're talking about academies and stuff. How was the Euros like for you? You watched the Euros on TV and, and how was it like? Did you catch anything uh, surprising or you know interesting? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me as a former central defender, <laughs> I uh, I enjoyed watching Italy. Big yeah, time. yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. I think that uh, what caught my eyes is uh, Chiellini and Bonucci are the let's say the dying breed of the centre backs, mm. the last of their species. Let's put it that way. <laughs> so it was really a pleasure to see that that uh, the performances throughout the games and yeah. uh, how much it means to have a strong defense. You and know, you and know the old saying, sorry, yes. attack attackers win a game, defenders win your title. So. Wow, that was nice. Uh, can you say that again? <laughs> yeah, so uh, the attackers win you games, uh, defenders win you titles. Beautiful. And uh, I, th I think it's no surprise that you're a centre-back centre as well, right? And then that's why you, you love these two guys, Bonucci and... Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Chiellini. Now, uh, let's talk a little bit about yourself in terms of your playing days, because I, obviously you're a centre-back, but talk a little bit about that and then the path you took into coaching and why. Yeah, so my career doesn't really have a very happy story. Uh, I think I was I was never the most talented player. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. But I was always the most hardworking. That I ah, can tell you. Right. Um, so and I was very pragmatic about what I can I cannot do, and uh, was always trying to let's say upgrade myself, push myself. Um, especially I think the the critical period for me when I was fourteen, mm -hmm. uh, and I realized that you know if I if I really want to play football. Uh, because that was like my growth spur and I was I became suddenly stronger and bigger than everyone else. Um, I really needed to invest in myself and uh, I don't encourage anyone to do this, right? But but just to say, coming from my background, from a country that sees football as a, as a salvation, a war-torn country, right? And at 14, I quit school, actually, mm. to pursue my football career. Right. Um, so I finished in night school, uh, 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 night middle school, and then uh, focused completely on, on, on training by myself, uh, individually training with a, a specialist trainers, and obviously with my team as well. So quickly I started playing uh, against older age groups. Right. Quickly I was promoted through the ranks of the academy they used to play for. And then when I was 16, I was offered a professional contract and I went through a preparation period to be the first team. Unfortunately, uh, during the preparation period, uh, there was a third or fourth game uh, in the preseason. And uh, yeah, last thing I remember is just uh, difficulty breathing and uh, woke up in hospital a few days later. So basically, um, you hear this word myocarditis going around pretty often now because yeah. of the vaccines. So I had uh, acute myocarditis, which, which caused a big problem uh, to my heart. So I had a cardiac arrest on the field. Wow. Yeah. And... Uh, it was pretty severe. I'm, I'm lucky to be alive, right? Mm. And uh, I wouldn't be coaching if maybe if that didn't happen. Yeah. Um, but uh, that was the end of my, of my <laughs> very short career. <laughs> very short career. Yes, yes. Um, I mean, I've been playing football since six or ten years, but uh, only in youth, <laughs> a little bit at senior level. Yeah. Um, but uh, but that was it, and then the recovery process and all this two years right, uh, right, right. took me to get back on the feet. Wow. So, so, so that condition is actually an enlargement of the, the heart. heart muscle, right? yes, heart yes. Muscle. And then it causes your heart to work irregularly. For me, it was, you know, irregular heartbeat mm. and skipping the beats. And yes, so, yes, so, yes. So I would like to take this opportunity to, to say to all the footballers and young players and coaches, especially, uh, this is not a joke. Yeah. So so really take this seriously and, and listen to the authorities' recommendation. Listen, we, we started this podcast uh, wanting to talk about academies and, and stuff like that to help coaches, but this is something that can help coaches as well, right? Your players, yeah. the, your, your asset, right? That's the most important thing. And what happens? Medical checkups. I think that's the most important thing. And, and good, very, very good start to uh, today's episode, Luca. Well done. Yeah. Uh, so, so you started coaching, mm -hmm. right? In, uh, after uh, 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 that setback. Now, 
what are the levels that you've coached uh, before so far? Yeah, so I uh, <laughs> actually when I stopped playing, I didn't know what to do to play myself, yeah. uh, to be honest. Um, and then I tried a few things, but uh, then uh, my club is uh, Partizan Belgrade. Mm. Uh, I think you heard of it, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. Um, so I, I did everything to get a chance to volunteer there. In the end, they gave me a month to volunteer. And that was like, let's say, my first experience with coaching. But after three days of being there, I knew that this is something I want to do. Yeah. Uh, this is something that I love doing and, you know, time is flying when I'm on the field. So, but I, what I also realized that the harsh truth is that at 18, nobody is really going to look at you as a coach and nobody is going to really give you an opportunity to, let's say, prove yourself, um, at least where, where I come from. And uh, opportunities to have a job that can financially sustain you, it was, it was almost mission impossible, right? Uh, studies were not something I was eager to continue at that point. Yeah. Okay. Don't look at me like that. I have master's degree now. Yeah. Okay. So don't, don't judge. Yeah? Yeah. We are we are all like that, Luca. Yeah. We are all, like, all kids are like that. Yeah, I was yeah. like that before. Yeah. So 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 then uh, I I started looking at opportunities abroad. Right. So um, I applied visas for US, for Australia, for Canada, for countries Western Europe, mm. all over the place. But because of um, let's say political situation and mm. things that time were unknown to me, I would just get answers as rejected, rejected yeah. and so on. It was very coincidental that I ran into a friend. Um, actually, I was coming back from the US embassy with a rejected visa. And I ran into a friend in the bus on the way back home who said, hey, you should go to Thailand. I said, what am I going to do in Thailand? <laughs> uh, but then, yeah, eventually through him, uh, I ended up in Bangkok and uh, uh, well, one small academy over there. Uh, I actually went there with a one-way ticket and, and no job. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had uh, about fifty dollars with me and a rental hostel in, in for one week, and then I got a opportunity to work in the in the academy. And uh, from then point on, my career has been going all over the place. Mm -hmm. I worked mm -hmm. as an individual coach, as a yeah. video analyst, as a first team coach, yeah. as a youth coach, as an amateur level, professional level. I worked. I actually now I can say I worked at the five different continents. Nice. So nice. And and li listen, we we talk about um, uh, the, one of the reasons why we started this as well is to help coaches and, and and what have you. And you know you talk about coaches who just started out. You know, get, getting their CE or, or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. They have difficulties to start yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And and then going back to what you have done is is crazier, right? Because yeah. coming from a, a so called war co a war torn country and then making the move across uh, the, the globe and stuff like that, yeah. that makes it even more difficult. So uh, again, to, to coaches who just are starting out, it's it's never easy. Nobody's going to take you seriously if you're 17, 18, 19. Trust me, okay? We all have been there as, as coaches. So that's... that's uh, so it's great news, Luca, yeah. that you've come across everywhere, across the globe and whatever, and you've come to sunny Singapore. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think the LCS are pretty much uh, grateful to have you. Now, let's talk about the theme uh, about academies here in Singapore and academies everywhere else in the world. Now, you are the technical director of the academy, the, the LCS, the Lion CD Sailors Academy. Now, tell us exactly what is the role of a technical director in an academy? Because people might ask, right, what, yeah. what is the role anyway, yeah. right? So, what is the role? Okay. I can tell you what's the role of TD, but I can tell you also what is my current role because something is something different a yeah. little bit. Um, I think what I'm doing at the moment is, besides being a TD, I'm also coaching. So, I'm running uh, one team and uh, I'm supervising uh, all the teams in the academy. Mm. So, that's the main role of a TD, to, to supervise... Uh, all the players and all the coaches in academy right. and help them and guide them okay. uh, um, throughout the developmental process. So number one thing would be to set academy structure and then to create a technical plan that is very simple to understand for both players and then easy for players to understand when the coaches transfer them the information, uh, training methodology, playing philosophy. But I think be part of it is also um, educating the coaches about what we want to do and how we want to do it, the way of getting there. Um, but also to create this this way of coaching. Um, work never stops, right? You you asked me today, yeah, is day off today? And <laughs> there is no days off yeah. in, in, in football. And that's maybe something that is hard to understand. Even this morning, I had a talk to my wife. She's like, so tomorrow it's public holiday. <laughs> I said, can we go for lunch? I said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's, yeah, it's it's basically all things uh, technical related to football. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. Now, judging from whatever you've said, you know, and, and people who are listening to this, you've got a huge 
what's the word responsibility on, on on your shoulders and your head and what have you and and sorry to the missus you know you, you're not gonna see your husband uh, so much uh, <laughs> but right it's it's a huge role yeah. right and we went i'm just going back to the the, the coaching part because you need to uh lead them or, or you know to to advise them yeah. how important is or uh, for you to recruit coaches, quality coaches, and do you do that yourself in terms of uh, the academy at LCS? No, absolutely. Um, I think that, let's say, it's easy to say, oh, we'll hire, we'll hire coaches from overseas because mm. they have experience working in better environments and so on. Yes, that's true, but uh, all the coaches from outside that come here will get a big shock about how the system works. Um, so I think that the mix of uh, foreign and local coaches is a is a yeah. great formula and, and so far it's been worked uh, very well um like you said i worked in singapore before yeah so i i know some coaches i worked with some coaches before as well uh, but i'm always open to to hear people out and to give especially young coaches opportunity because and this is what i taught all the coaches uh, those that are not with with the mm. academy anymore those that were before and those that still are is is uh, what do you want you know, if you want to learn, if you are open-minded, if you want to develop, the doors are open, man. But if you are coming there with your own mindset and this is how I do things, yeah. then it's very difficult. It's it's very it's a very very good point, a very important point as well. Because and and you you have been here in Singapore before, so that help has helped yeah. uh, as well. And uh, you talk about the the combination of the foreign coaches and the local coaches and you have had brought you know had brought a few yeah. of the foreign coaches yeah. and the local ones and i got to say this right because uh the, my, my son is at the academy as well the 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 quality of the youth or the local coaches there absolutely brilliant spot yeah. on you know and and i think kudos to you and the club itself i, I think they've been very very good so uh well done how important is your role in a in a in a general view looking at the youths of, of today in terms of football wise how, how important is your role yeah i mean you you said a good thing just now that it's a big responsibility right and i i enjoy that responsibility i <laughs> i think the pressure is, is is privilege and we are privileged to work in this sport that that provides us with uh, yes opportunities but also a lot of uh, heavy weight on our shoulders um i think that that in terms of player development the culture is number one thing that is for me uh let's say most important for the betterment of the youth because yeah. football culture itself in singapore is i would leave it at a question mark it's, it's yeah. questionable let's yeah. say and it starts from the youngest age right mm -hmm. so i think creating a player-centric culture is very important and now going back to coaches a lot of coaches find it difficult to understand because they always want to correct they always want to change they always want to tell the player what to do and this is this is something that we've proven throughout throughout history that that it's it's not really helping that much. It makes coaches feel better about themselves, <laughs> but it doesn't really help the player develop. So so I think that there is this level of adaptation that needs to be adopted by everyone, players, coaches, myself, parents even. Um so I think the the, the number one is that creating that culture that can't be forced and it's it takes time uh, to to, uh, to implement and then it's up to players, coaches, and all the football workers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm also going to mention Uncle Zhu, who is uh, who is just uh, taking care of the facilities, and Uncle John, mm -hmm. also Jackson, who is logistics. I mean, all these guys you don't hear about them, but they are equally important, important mm -hmm. like everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in this, so and then it's up to everybody involved, either they want this or they don't want. And at the end of the day, these are the people that will change the culture. It's not me. It's everybody all together. It's it's. Uh, I'm happy that you said that because I think you spoke about everything else, not only about the coaching part, but also the team behind, right? People like Jackson and all whom I'm, I I know a little bit, and they they make the the, the wheel move right from top to and everybody has got to move in the same direction. Yeah. If if you know, and if one person cocks up the show, yeah. then then it's a problem. Very very good point again. Now just going back to the coaches' recruitment, right? Just just name me a few qualities that you look for when you are just picking a coach out to to work in your academy. Yeah. Now number one is being open minded. Yeah, and then uh, in addition to that is is willingness to learn. Yeah, and then uh, really being hardworking because I I can tell you that we, we talk about commitment, right? But a lot of times I interview people that. They wanted to apply for a job and and second or third question is so how much leave do i get 
and for me that's it's over it's done mm. there is nothing else to talk about so so i think those three things that like, it's really you know you as a coach of course you are important or you have you have a big role to transfer your knowledge to the to the to the kids yeah. but at the same time you're part of the system yeah. and you need to be uh, able to adapt to them do you really get that question how many leaves do you get in a yeah I, uh, it happens you know, you, you know when 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 people ask these questions then they've never been in football before no seriously right and uh, you know you, you've played or, or you you've coached yeah. there, there is no leave in football yeah. you yeah. know and yeah uh, leave them out <laughs> <laughs> now um before this it was LFA yeah. right in uh, the, the academy which is called uh, LFA now have you come in and and changed things around or or have you done a little tweaks here and there or how has that been the the transition from LFA to LCS yeah i i, I think i need to globalize things a little bit here nice. and take a step back because it's i want to say it's this is a thing with LFA mm. i would say it's a thing with every academy in singapore um Number one thing I also ask the coaches or the players or, or, or uh, colleagues, what is what is your benchmark? So what are you comparing yourself to? How do you know that what you are doing is good enough? That has effect or that needs improvement? Or how how do you do that? So and a lot of actually a lot of people don't even think about that. That's the first thing. Uh, it's just sort of we are doing our own thing you know we are a part of the system yeah but i'm still doing my my own thing this is not the case only in singapore so i'm not criticizing just yeah, singapore yeah. academies it's 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 all over the world but i think um the big thing is then to have a look at the are we looking at things short term or long term because if there is no plan then there is no long term development and then you have the i think everybody should start thinking about what's what's my final outcome what's our final goal yeah. where we want to go yeah. right so so maybe small answer but also small advice is think about where you want to go and then take a step back and mm. start from beginning so did i change uh, i give you this introduction so i can give you a better answer yeah. so definitely i've i've changed a lot of things mm. um first of all we need to define what we want and where we want to go and then make a really extensive plan of how to get there so if you have another uh, three four days to discuss this, I'll be happy to <laughs> to explain. <laughs> <laughs> then, then we'll have ten parts to this uh, yeah. episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, I I think what you said is correct about the long long term goals, right? I mean, because if there's no long term goals, then it's going to be a little bit difficult to do your planning and stuff. Now, what are the challenges you have faced uh, as a TD at the academy so far? Yeah. I, uh, Where do we start, right? Yes, I mean that's uh, that's a thing. Uh, besides the obvious questions, I mean, mm. I made a really big list about things that we need to overcome, but but I try to let's say cut it down to the six okay. key ones yeah. that I feel are very very important. I think num number one is the problem of quantitative nature. So uh, somebody told me I, I really forgot who it was. Yeah. Uh, they did an analysis of how many active players are there playing football on all levels, grassroots or, let's say, competitive, from 7 to 17 years old. Mm -hmm. Do you know the answer to that question? Tell me, Luca. Yeah, there's 10,000 players. Okay. And I can tell you, my, my first week coming at, at uh, Fine Art, where I used to work previously, um, and under nine had trials, yeah. under nine, yeah. right? Had trials, they were looking for one slot, and they made this small advert in the newspaper and a small posting on Facebook, and really? uh, two days later, 2,000 kids show up all that are under nine years old yeah so from all over the country so so i think that tells you i mean don't, don't compare yourself to to netherlands right yeah, of course but if you look at malaysia 26 million people if you look at the vietnam thailand i mean uh, that's a first problem so you so you you really the, the pool of players you can work with okay that's a challenge let's put it that way then second we mentioned a, a football culture um i think that that people don't really understand uh, especially parents what is really required of a child to have a football career and, and and let me give you this metaphor because this is the same I, I give to the parents as well uh, when they say oh he's gonna miss the training next week because no reason right I say okay but can you miss school instead and then come to training and then they get a shock well, how do you mean so well if you want your child to make a steps in football development he can't skip first or second grade because same like he misses a day of school he needs to go back and learn those things right um, number three is commitment. I think uh, also relates to school is, is balancing football and, and personal life. Yeah. Uh, we get a lot of players now that are doing their P 
PSLEs, they are yeah. NO levels, they are mid-year exams. Yeah. And they say, oh, I can't come because I have to study. I mean, everywhere in the world, uh, players balance school and study. So I don't see why it's mm. Singapore any different. Yeah. Maybe that relates to culture as well. Yeah. The next one will be competition. Sorry, I mean, I can go on, but... Carry on, <laughs> but carry on, Luca. Uh, competition, yeah. So, so obviously, we have this league and that league and, and so on. And, and I think regardless of which league you join, the, 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 the competition you can have is very limited. It's not enough. It's not enough. Yes. It's not enough. Number of games, there is not enough. Number of quality opponents, there is... It's, it's a challenge, right? Because we can train all day long. Like, look at us now during COVID. Yeah. We are training like sure. crazy, but... If you don't play games, it's right. really hard to gauge where you are. Yeah. Um, and then last two is things that, that I don't think any of us can really change much. Is uh, First is the DSA. Mm. Uh, I didn't know what DSA is and, okay. and I'm just going to say I'm not criticizing schools. Right? Yeah. It's, it's, they have to do what I think is it's, it's right. What I don't understand here is the parents again. Mm. Because, um, so if, if I understand correctly, if yeah. you can correct me if I'm wrong, is my child is very good at football. Yep. And he's not good at school. Okay. So I'm going to use the fact that he's good at football and put him to a better school so he can struggle even more academically. Yeah. So that's that really makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, so I think that's that's one of the reasons why we created this scholarship program. That we can, let's say, um, even out with the, with the benefits of having a DSA. Yeah. And then lastly is, is NS. So I mean, uh, missing two years at any level of your career can yeah. be detrimental. True. So, but these things we can't go around about. It's a good point you made about the DSA. Now, tell us a little bit about LCS's scholarship. I think yeah. we want to know as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. So, so I think, in all honesty, Lee is a better person to talk about this. Yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> but he did everything to cater yeah. to, let's say, a parent uh, who has a child who is about to go to uh, year 12, I'm not sure, yeah. is it? Um, so, basically, we, we, we offer players with, uh, with, uh, with the opportunities to learn more so but you need to be more committed so basically you're training five six times a week but at the same time once you come to our facility which is finally going to be completed next year is uh, you have the teachers there waiting for you to help you if you're struggling with studies you have uh, you have a school liaisons who are speak in touch with your form teachers and whatnot and then we want to have a cooperation with schools also for them to host them at our venue um, for them to understand what we are doing to the players and right. sort of implement and have right. synergy with schools to our players continue not only football but academic development as well. Right. And uh, has this started, by the way? Yeah, the 2008 is the first generation. Right. Uh, we have about 16, 15, 16 boys. And now the next generation will be 2009. Mm. Uh, we are in the process of uh, signing agreements with various number of players. Beautiful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, what do you look for in a, a young player? especially in the elite side of things, right? Uh, and, and, you know, you talk about recruitment yeah. as well as maybe promotion from the B team to the A team. What, what, what are you exactly looking at? I mean, look, um, you, you need to have something, right? And, yeah. and you, you said this yourself in the beginning. We, we, are, we are doing this podcast so we can have the culture, so we can share yeah. and all this, right? right. So we, people have to understand that, that at the end of the day, we are coaches. We are not magicians. So... I can't make a play. I wish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so football is for some players is for to compete and to develop to have a career. For some people, it's just to have fun and enjoy it. Which there is no right and wrong. As long as people yeah. love football, they should be mm -hmm. a part of it. Um, so I think that the first thing that we're looking for is that you need to have something. So, is it uh, quickness and is it your motoric skills? Is it your technical level? Is it your awareness or game insight? I right. mean, you can you can name your pick. But uh, all of these things for me mm. are underneath the personality traits. So first of all, you as a player, you really need to have a football intelligence and you need to be able to you know, be resilient, not to give up too easy. You need to be goal-directed, meaning you want to achieve certain things yeah. um, and you need to have sports specific attributes as well. Yeah. So uh, you can see this, for example, even when the kids, people ask you, how do you define this for seven, eight years old? I mean... Um, I'll give you an example that was given to me. So if if you ask a eight year old player, run twenty meters as fast as you can. So he's gonna try his best, no question. But if you tell him, Okay, now next round you're gonna compete against your best friend, so which round you think he's gonna run faster? 
So, so these ways is there are ways to induce competition, right? right? And then when you create an environment where all those players that compete, mm. all the football, the team sport, individuals yeah. will come out eventually. Right, right. It's 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 creating the environment and make it functional as well. Yep. It's, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a it's a good point again. Now I want to ask you, right? Uh, as as te- a technical director of the academy teams, you know, you talk about the fourteen year olds, the fifteen year olds, and, yeah. and and what have you. What is your relationship with the first team coaches of LCS? Yep. Uh, is there any relationship you even speak to each other, and and how important is this relationship going well, forward? Yeah. Well, I think everybody know that we have recently got a new coach. Yeah. And he's just out of quarantine. In two weeks or so. Okay. Um, I have to say, th- the day he came out of quarantine, he came down to the academy because he was interested to know what okay. we are doing and how we are doing it. And so on. after that, we had one long discussion, and we're going to continue having discussions about the synergy between academy and the first team. Right. Uh, so in in terms of coach, him very open, very direct. You know, very interesting. That mm-hmm. for me was that he uh, really wants to know what we are doing, and how we do it. Uh, currently, there are exchanges in various areas. So, in terms of performance, we have head of science in the first team. We have a head of performance now in the academy. Um, we have video na- analysts in the first team and academy. These are all the people that are yeah. working together at the moment and uh, exchanging knowledge. I think the link between academy and the first team is still most important for players because too many times I witness um, various reasons of this not working. Is it political? Is it because of feelings? Uh, that uh, players are not allowed to move up or down or uh, and so on. So I think this is this will be a number one thing that we need to yeah. eliminate yeah. and uh, to make sure that uh, each player has a, a proper opportunity. But in order for that to happen, uh, we need to have a structure uh, to transition the players from junior to senior football, which at the moment, for me personally, I feel it's lacking. Mm. But uh, it will take some time. It, it does only de- depend on us. also depends about FA Sports SG and so on. Do you think the gap is a little bit too big as well? I mean, from you, you talk about 16, 17, 18, yeah. and then from the 19, the gap to the first team. I mean, look, this is this is very individual, right? So you have some players who who go to an S and they come out and they yeah. are good enough. You have some that won't. But uh, I think realistically speaking, is the players need to have at least like six months buffer mm-hmm. up upon completing the NS yeah. to move up. And then those players that decide so let's say go and as er, later yeah. as uh, as the most commonly is done now. Right. Um, yeah. Again, it's individual. Right. Yeah. Look, how do you define success in your role as a TD? It, it's again, it's very uh, subjective. But I want yeah. to know in your opinion, right? In your opinion, I I, I yeah. don't want to know about KPIs because yeah. I I hate the word KPIs. You know, from management and what have you. Yes. But I just want to know your opinion. What is success to you as a TD? I think. The uh, number one thing is representing LCS and with that representing a Singapore or a team from Singapore internationally yeah. and being recognized as a, a good youth development program, mm-hmm. yeah. um, which I think this, this has to be out of question. Otherwise, yeah. I'm not doing my job, right? You know? yeah. um, I think creating individuals yeah. that are one level, level higher okay. than, let's say, current yeah. players that Singapore has. Um, Having young players who will have opportunities to play overseas, uh, that's very important. Mm. Uh, creating coaches who will be able to lead uh, Singapore youth and senior teams in the future. Yeah. And I think ultimately creating well-rounded individuals, not only players, but coaches as well. Yeah. Um, I, I think this question is a little bit unfair if you're going to name names. So I don't want you to be naming names, right? Any particular talents we should be looking out for in the next few years, uh, and and you don't have to name names because again I, I say this is very unfair, right? Yeah. To to you know it's it's uh, it's too yeah. young. But you see things, certain players. Do you see things? I mean, you, you said don't name names, yeah. and uh, well, you were about I, to name. No, names. no, I was not planning <laughs> to okay. name any names. Good, anyways, good. so yeah, I think um, I think also I give an introduction to this answer as well. Right, right. I think you need to look a bit further away yeah. and uh, realize all the UTR initiatives and things that are happening, Mm. you're looking at the players that will be able to compete in the qualifiers for World Cup 2034, right? Which is 2032. Mm. So then you're looking at players born from 2002 to 2012. Let's say that's what you're looking at. I can talk about players 2004 to 2012 because those are the batches that I I know. Um, I think if you look at all those generations, you can, from each generation, take one, maybe three, maybe if you are really lucky, mm. five players. Mm. And then out of all those generations, having that number of players, you can make a 
very solid team that can compete very well. That's that's what I can tell you. And if you want to know players themselves, I mean, you can look at our social media. There's quite a few of them yeah, I know. over there. <laughs> So that, that's, I mean, coming from you, right? It's, it's pretty promising yeah. if you just really look at it. It's not, not promising, it looks positive, right? Yeah. And then I think that's the only way to go, right? Just look forward and, and you know, just, just work hard, you yeah. know, just move forward. How do you foresee the LCS Academy in the next five years and your hopes, your personal hopes for the Academy itself? Yeah, I, I, I hope that uh, number one will be allowed to play in your future. <laughs> because uh, yes, because so we can uh, start playing some games and start traveling and and exposing these players to the level competition that is that is suitable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for me personally, uh, I want to see the club club culture grows because even now at this stage, when we have a new player come in, they are a little bit shook. Like, oh, we need to train this much and we need to do this and need mm-hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I I, I want to mention one silly thing is that before. When he just started, the player would just walk in and he would just sit down and uh, stare at his phone and all this. But now the the player knows he walk in first and he to fist bump every single one, yeah. every single person that is over there, yeah. um, because that's my way of saying hello, yeah. right? And uh, you know you can see them running to coaches, to yeah. to uncles working there and so on. That that's a big big part of it, yeah. a big part of it. Um, I think creating environment of self development and self expression, yeah. so allowing everybody to be heard, yeah. allowing everybody. Uh, uh, let's say freedom, but also tools to develop. Yeah. Um, I think developing also this first generation of scholars, mm-hmm. as you mentioned before, it's very important because that first generation will will give us a clear picture yeah. in the in the results, right? Yeah. But also we started the let's say early enlistment project for some yeah. of the players. Yeah. So I want to see how far those early enlistees can go. Yeah. So I would say prove that scholarship program works, mm. and also provide opportunity to those early enlistees. To have a, a chance to play somewhere in Europe, yeah, I I really love the point you made about the non-football stuff, yeah, because that is life skills, yeah. right? You know, saying hi, pushing your foot and throwing it away when you, once you walk in because you're, you're there for football, right? And and the other uh, part is about you know just. Uh, it's, it's life skills, right? It, yeah. Things that you don't teach uh, in a coaching manual and, and stuff like that. So I think that's that's very, very important. Uh, any advice for new coaches coming in and wanting to start coaching? Not at LCS, but anywhere yeah. else in the world or in yeah. Singapore especially, you know, they're, they're, they're wanting to coach. Even parents who are yeah. shouting by the, the, the <laughs> sideline, but, you know, they, yeah. you know, just what, what are your advice? I, I think for parents would be uh, find a coach that you like mm. and who you let's say, who you think is doing well by your child and let him do his job because really you're not helping. Let's play the way. Um, I know the parents have a uh, best uh, intention, they don't mind, but mostly uh, emo- act emotionally. Right. And the coach should be always doing the objective thing, which yeah. is not always Great. the easiest. Great. In terms of coaches, uh, young coaches, um, what, what what exists today did not exist when I started coaching. So you can, with two clicks, you can search anything you want, anything you want to know about. And there is no rights and wrongs in football. There is no one single truth. This is how the way things should be done. Mm. So I would say explore as much as you can, learn every day Mm. and expose yourself to as many different scenarios as possible because get yourself out of comfort zone. That's the only way you will grow. Mr. Luka Lalic. TD of uh, the Lion City Sailors, thank you so much for being on this episode of the Coaches Dugout, the podcast for Coaches by Coaches. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, it has been really informational, uh, educational as well for the coaches out there who are, you know, who are already in the coaching business as well as those who are coming out, who are starting out because like we always say, it is not a bed of roses. You know, it's, it's about hard work. There are no days off there are no leaves by the way and uh, you gotta you know the, the the wifey and the missus have got to sacrifice a little bit right so thank you so much if you're listening and you're watching this on youtube as well uh, follow us on the coaches dugout we are on ig on youtube as well we will be out on spotify and thank you till the next episode this is the coaches uh, dugout podcast cheers Mr. Luka, thank you so much no, it was very very good yeah thank you so much man i think uh